Great. As ready. always, I appreciate. Thank you. As always, I appreciate uh, the ability to see you and realize I'm function. I'm I'm interacting with real life human beings. Uh, even even some of you busy in the kitchen. Um, okay. And other otherwise fine. Okay. So. Um, we discussed last time, we got into the figure of Eliphaz. Um, I have a different plan of action for tonight. We're gonna to be stepping back a little bit, but I wanna go back, open up again the fifth chapter of Eov, if you wanna pull out uh, your copies of Eov, and look again, consider this Pasuk, which is of the more quotable and relevant in Eov, and one that it comes up in life, I find frequently. It's Perik Hey Pasuk, Zion, that's the fifth chapter, seventh verse. Ki adam la amal yulad, uvnei reshef yagbiu uf. Man is born to, Archibald says, weariness, I prefer toil, while the spirits soar in flight. Uf, like oaf. And this idea that it's straightforward and refreshingly simple. But it seems to me, Eliphaz is the one who brings us the idea. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it would change a person's life if they adequately thought about it and then internalized it. That we're here not to have a good time. It's fine to have a good time. I mean, don't get me wrong. Fun's okay. I'm not a, partic I'm not a particular um, fan of fun because I find it you know, a little bit oppressive sometimes. Hi, Shamai. Oh, some of you heard me on this topic, but I might as well, I might as well uh, get on my soapbox. Why not? Uh, you know, fun is often oppressive. It's, you know, are we having fun yet? This is fun, right? Eo's fun. No, we're having fun. Yeah, it's, uh, there's almost an erotic uh, attempt to, to that, all that fun. Um, where I find that a lot of the time life is fun. I like this. I mean, okay, it's not fun, especially the third paragraph of Eo. Wow, that's way not fun. But you know, like the, the discourse and the insight, you know, the coming up with you know, the change the exchange of ideas and maybe coming away a little bit more insightful and maybe even having challenged your own conception of things. I, I love growing. I love thinking. I love being stimulated like that. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Torah is so wonderful and so great to learn because it should, in, in the ideal sense, it really should do all those things. So, but it, it's hard work and it requires an effort. It's the same thing. Picture yourself in Gemara Shir. I hope that's not giving too many of you nightmares. Picture yourself right now in Gemara Shir. And we go from, I mean, if it's my class, for example, we're going from random questions. We're talking about all kinds of fun stuff. And then the Rebbe says in his in, in that tone of voice, he says, okay, everybody take out your Gemaras. Let's open up. And everybody yawns. Let's go. Let's do it. What? What? Wait, Ezra, what? And somebody inevitably yawns. Oh, great. That's exactly what you're going to say. Right. You got you're it. Say that? That's what I was going to say. You know, you know, my, my, uh, my, my own of thinking. Yeah. It's some true. of you know me better than I know myself. Right. Exactly. It's true. Um, right. Those of you who don't know this, but pay attention, track me. I'm right. hundred percent. Look around the room. Somebody will yawn. What's going on behind that? Is, is, Connection? Are you? Are we? Are we coming through? Okay. It's a little like on and off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thumbs up. Is it possible somebody upstairs is down is downloading? I'll be back in a second. And I'm sorry about the interruption. Let me let me uh, look. Actually, the issue would generally be if someone's uploading. I think Zoom uses a lot either way, I think. Because you have to download all of our platforms uh, as well. Let's see. Let's Look at everyone with their haircuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Sam, we got a house full of, uh, of, of people here. So lots going on. Uh, is okay now? Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, let me try to finish the thought because it shouldn't be this complicated. It's taking me longer than I realized. Just this idea that anytime you have to put forth any effort, subconsciously, and most of that, most of this is not a conscious process. Subconsciously, you just you don't want to. I mean, we're lazy by nature. 
Right, the Ramchal describes that beautifully too in the Mesila Sisharim, in the Path of the Just. He says, he says by nature we're just, it's, we're heavy. We're heavy in limbs and heavy in spirit. And in the winter it's too cold outside. And in the summer it's too hot and cozy in the bed right now. I don't want to get up, right? And that's just, that's just good getting up out of bed. But anytime we're asked to make any kind of an effort, any kind of an exertion, right? It, it, it goes against our grain. It's against our nature. And, um, it, you know, comes Eliphaz and defines what it is to be a human being in the optimal sense. And that is, um, we're here to toil. Dovi, welcome. Uh, we're, here to, we're here to toil and we're here to work hard and roll up our sleeves and go. And uh, it seems to me we're not trained for that today because we're, we're, the uh, Western culture is such that we're, we are in it to um, play and go on vacation and have weekends and have fun. Uh, so he says that man is born to toil, and that means when it happens, it's not a punishment necessarily. And uh, as we have in uh, this week's parsha, we mentioned the other day too, Bahu Gosai, uh, the famous Rashi that talks about it's all in the amelus. It's all in the amelus. It's all in the uh, you know your ability to struggle and strive, and you know that that's true. No pain, no gain. Lufunsara agra. Anytime you want to do something meaningful mm-hmm. in life. Uh, Athletes push themselves. Familiar theme. It's one of one of one of the ones I wind up talking about a lot because it seems to me uh, it's it's right at the core of so much of our struggle today. If you don't struggle, you'll never grow. If you know if there's no what's the law of physics, right? Without friction, there's no movement. Everything everything is just smooth. Uh, but then there's no growth. There's no there's no opportunity for um, for genu- genuine uh, progress. And then he says, of course, and, and that's exactly why the last part of the Pasuk is very well translated in our scroll. Then the spirit soars. And it's through the process, through the toil, the hard work, that actually that enables you to, uh, to do phenomenal things. And so if you encounter difficulty in life, uh, embrace it, accept it. Teaches Eliphaz. Comments, thoughts on that? Avi Elshir. Who was who Isaac who was just here? Somebody had a, somebody had a name. They said Isaac. No, that, was, okay. that was me. That was me. It was, uh, the other okay, one. fine, fine. Great. Nice, nice, nice uh, pseudonym. Here, okay. Um, um, the next uh, person. Uh, yeah? Practically speaking, how would Olifaz's advice um, work? Meaning, like, how does you, you know, who's right now, like, unable to really move, like, move forward? so to speak. Yeah, I mean, we've said this about Alifaz. You know, he, he's, he's the prototype. He's the classic example of a person who says, great insights. It's just all in the timing, Alifaz. You know, I, right now you need to tell, uh, you know, Eov this advice. Pick, pick, pick a little bit, you know, your, your timing, your tact a little bit more carefully now. Uh, right, I don't know what he expects Eov to do with this nugget. And it is a nugget. It's gorgeous. It's a wonderful piece. But um, that's why we're born. And we reviewed these ideas. That's what we're doing in this world. We are, uh, the, the Gemara asks, I don't think we talked about this, but here, here's just something to consider from the Gemara. Um, when we're amel, when we toil, when we struggle, Gemara asks, is that an amelus of the mouth? Amal b'feh or amal b'malacha, or is it more? We are more classically inclined to think is that something that we do? We work hard. So it brings a couple psukim. It says ki achaf alav pihu, means something. It's struggling of the mouth. The mouth is the way we connect with Hashem. We imitate Hashem. It's it's the expression of our intellect. Uh, and so then we talk much more of an intellectual kind of a, a struggle, a pursuit, trying to trying to mold our minds to think with a certain greater finesse and expertise. Um, so then within that, there's the question, is that a melus b'tayra? Is it an amelus b'sicha? What's the difference? They're overlapping. But do you try to toil and learn the most challenging area of Torah when you're, when you're, when you're struggling, when you're challenging yourself? You remember this distinction between bitl's man and bitl Torah? It's not the only definition, but one of the definitions, Bittel Zman is the guy who's just wasting his life, wasting his time. 
Bitzel Torah may be that too, but it also may be something more specific. It may be that he's simply not challenging himself enough. He's doing something that's maybe several notches too easy and not really pushing his mind to its maximum potential. It's not really an omel, somebody who sweats and uh, breaks his teeth in the base medrash. Um, Amelus Pesicha, are you, are you particularly careful in the way you speak? You know, do you consider everything? Uh, is, is the Torah always in your mouth? The uh, Yeshua gets the um, it, directive, Lo Yamush Sefer Torah has Picha. This, the, the Sefer Torah, the content of the Torah should never move through your mouth. That's, a, that's an effort. That's a melus patera. And of course, um, the ultimate image that we get from the, in Parshish uh, uh, Chukas, we say, Zosa Torah, Adam Kiyamus Ba'ohel. Now on the surface, the, the simple meaning is we're talking about Tumas Mace, we're talking about impurity inside of an enclosed structure. But Reish Lakish very famously darshans it and says, this is the Torah, a man should die in a tent, in addition to meaning what it sounds like, that a person dies and then gives over his impurity, his tumah. Um, it means that the tent is the tent of Torah. Oil is often likened to Torah. And a person should quite literally kill himself in the tents of Torah. He should, he should put, put forth great effort, great amelus. And uh, Reish Lakish, by the way, did. That's what, that's, after he accepted in that famous Gemara and Baba Metzi accepted the challenge, he's going to learn Torah, and then he didn't stop. And the man was a madman in that sense. And he would, night and day, and he'd go at it, and, uh, and it's really hard. I, you know, people, people you know, really pushing yourself to your limits. Uh, I'm trying to think, you know, has there been such a time like that? Has anybody, does anybody identify with this? Have you ever had this, have you ever had such an experience where you're, um, you're sweating over the learning of the Torah? Am I, is, am I mistaken? Ezra, you're the only one from your year right here, right now. Uh, Ari Schwimmer said he might come. Um, but Ezra, can you hear me, Ezra Schwartz? Yeah, great. So you guys, I wasn't there. I, 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 I'm, I'm jealous, but I, I recall how you all together, the whole Shear, were on fire during Leil Matan Torah, the night of Shavuos. Do you remember your year learning learning together tor, um, on, on, uh, all night long on, on Torah? You were hazring our Gemara, Bates. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were in the corner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I hear. And I, I know, I know that you, uh, you guys, you guys really, um, as Robert Brickman described it, you were very much on fire. So that kind of an experience, when you just put everything into it, and you know, you lose sleep day and night, and you exert yourself. Um, Rabbi Greenwald today, if I'm not says, mistaken, I, we, we sort of. Rabbi, Rabbi Greenwald yeah. says it, it doesn't count unless you sweat. So Ezra Kolsky made a rap about right, that. Right, right. But I think a lot of the time, look, we have a, I, Rabbi Greenwald and, Greenwald and I share this criticism of a lot of what we do in Derech, and I think it's, maybe it's unavoidable, I don't know, and the nature of where people are coming from and what they're willing to do. But, um, you know, we're, we're forced to sort of teach Torah as entertainment now. We have to do, we have to tell a few jokes and do a tap dance and, uh, sort of spoon feed you bubbles, you know, so you should have, you shouldn't have to work too hard. And every now and then people do us the courtesy of, of actually tuning in. I'm sorry, were you talking rabbi? Was that some, was that you were giving over some Torah? Cause I'm, I'm on my phone right now. I can't really be bothered. Right. So that's sort of the antithesis of what Torah really requires, but I guess we have to get people to that level where they're willing to put in the effort and uh, such things are anathema nowadays. Uh, yeah, Zosa Torah Adam Kim Yamus Ba'ohel teaches Eliphaz, and maybe not exactly the right time and place, but it's a good lesson for us nonetheless. A um, couple of psukim later, we read Eliphaz says, well, I'll read 8 too, so we see the connection. For man is born to weariness again while the spirits soar in, soar in flight, 8. But as for me, I would search out the Almighty, direct my speech to Hashem. Okay, the but is very interesting. As he tries to learn Torah, clearly he's, he's implying, not so subtly, that he should also 
Uh, he said, he said, you should wear toil and just seek out Hashem. Um, there's, you know, the word, you know what a good word for this is? How your, how, how Eliphaz is coming through to you? Um, Rebbe, the, it's getting very choppy. There's again. a glibness. You know the word glibness? Thank you. Still? Because I don't. It's hard to hear you. Your audio and video are cutting in and out. It's my fault, right? We'll check again. Technical difficulties. Yeah, how are we doing? Any better? Sorry. Yep, okay. that was good. Okay, uh, we strive for professionalism, don't always reach it. Uh, yeah, glibness, the word glib means overly slick and smooth and maybe just a, a tad uh, insensitive. Edin, Edin joined at one point. Hi, Edin. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, that's, that's how Elifaz comes off. Again, trying to emphasize this. Elif was a, a complicated, maybe problematic figure, but he's hard to put in a box. A lot of what he says is quotable and wonderful. And so don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, we're, we're so far critical of his, um, his style of saying things, not necessarily what he's saying. Uh, try, to keep that, try to keep that distinction in mind. Oh, Aaron Hekmati's here. That's nice. Okay. Um, yeah, so he says now in Pusuk 9, uh, he says, who performs great deeds beyond, beyond comprehension? Wonders beyond num numbering. Who brings rain upon the earth, sends waters over the open country? He's trying to let Eo think big and trying to, you know, tell him to look up a little bit and consider, you know, the magnitude of the world and in such a perspective so you 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 realign what you're thinking and you realize it's all Hashem and he he does everything and it's beyond our comprehension and so all we can do is is uh try to reach try to try to try to connect to Hashem uh the pasuk may sound familiar it's another famous one it says osig dolos ve'en cheker niflaos um ad in mispar i read it in english intentionally anybody recognize that hebrew should I do it again? Um, if you don't recognize it, please be um, duly embarrassed. O sigdolos ve'en cheker, niflaos ad ein mispar. No, it doesn't ring a bell? Aiden in davening, right? We, we, we certainly do. Sounds yeah. vaguely familiar. It's can't really be just that's all that's only vaguely familiar yeah i'm I almost I'm, I'm, I'm considering a cruel trick can i give you all homework Is that in my and maybe somebody come back tomorrow night with a proper answer of where that's from Is unless somebody can, can save us right now is it in my can you repeat it well among other places yes can you repeat it sure one last time Osigdolos ve'en cheker. It's not quite the same lashon we're used to, but uh, similar enough. Osigdolos ve'en cheker niflaos ad ein mispar. He does wonders. Who performs wonders? Uh, great deeds beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension. Wonders beyond num numbering. In any case, to get to the content of the verse, uh, we learn here that uh, Hashem, Hashem is beyond our understanding. The Gemara in Tainis, in the very beginning, Punked right at the very beginning of Tainis, it talks about Hashem, who's manifest, and we can find it manifested through uh, incomprehensible things like rainfall, something that we take for granted, but if we consider it, it's extraordinary. Um, Chazal see it as a kind of birya bifne atzmo, right? It's, it's almost like another creature rainfall. And it points to, I mean, how does it work exactly? 
I mean, we know the science, we can break it down. There's, there's cloud pressure, there's evaporation, but um, the fact that it's also calibrated and it works and we're also dependent on it. You remember the Gemara there also says the famous idea that um, rain was, was not one of the original uh, parts of creation the first week. Why? Uh, so Adam would have for it. Yeah, very good, Ari. Right. It, there, it, rain is one of those things that connects us. It bonds us with Hashem. Mm -hmm. We need it to live. Without it, we wouldn't have crops. We wouldn't have uh, food. We wouldn't have life. But, uh, but Hashem is not about to give it so, so, uh, so uh, easily. He wants us to be involved. He wants Adam to be alive to uh, daven for us. So only after Adam was properly created was, uh, did rain, was the possibility of rain brought into the universe. And uh, the whole nature of rain, we're meant to consider. I mean, again, our dependence, um, the devastation when it doesn't come. But when it is there, there's a certain um, gentle sweetness to it as well. And water, to consider it a little, little drops of water, a picture like a, a, a photograph that just plays with the delicate little drops of water, how gentle and, and pure it all looks. But water we know can devastate, can make it tsunami can uh, destroy our house with mold and other kinds of uh, almost all almost all decay and erosion is somehow water-based. So it's, it's life-affirming and life-giving and simultaneously totally destructive and to the human mind, totally incomprehensible. So what's Alifa's major idea? I mean, he's speaking in rhymes and riddles. It's not entirely clear, but he is trying to slap EO around just a bit and get him to think of the loftier issues in the world. Sometimes when you go there, somehow your own personal problems uh, get a whole new perspective. Uh, Eliphaz winds down, plus the parrot goes on. Uh, he has a lot more to say. Eliphaz, will, you'll see, if, especially if you go through the whole thing, which I encourage you to do, um, is the wordiest of all the friends by far. Uh, he's only outdone by Eo, who's quite a talker himself. Um, Eliphaz winds down his words. I want to say words of comfort, except they're really not. Uh, he tells in 25, he tells Eo, you will know that your seed is manifold, your, de your descendants as the grass of the field. He tells him this. Now, I mean, what kinds of words are these? Eo just lost his, de his descendants. We've been talking a lot because it's in Parsha. We talk about the um, Avera of Onus Tvarim. You remember that idea? Onus Tvarim, you're not allowed to do or say anything mm -hmm. to cause another Jew um, any pain or sadness. Well, no. what is it? I mean, the, the picture book idea is you're not allowed to uh, ask a childless person, uh, you know, uh, tell them about how your children misbehaved last night. I mean, they'd love to have misbehaving children. They don't have any themselves. And um, Eo, in an even more extreme situation, had children and they were all lost. And now he tells them, your descendants, Eliphaz tells them, your, your descendants will be as the grass of the field. Doesn't seem like it. 26, he says, you will go to the grave in ripe old age, as the sheaf is taken in in its time. And then 27, see all this, we have considered it so. Oh, hear it. And as for you, absorb it. I think I've said this phrase before, but it's couldn't be more apt. He's got the subtlety of a sledgehammer, you know. <laughs> Just take it, Eo. Come on, what's your problem, buddy? I mean, well, okay, you see, you had 10 kids, they're all dead and no wealth anymore, and, you know, afflictions all over your body, but come on. You'll be fine. You'll get through this. Be just fine. Cheer up, right? Well, we... We just finished the, the, uh, the, the end of the fifth chapter. Right? And again, the last words are almost too brazen to be real. He says, Just get with it, yo. Snap out of it. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to continue reading because Perik um, Vav is all Eo and is it ever. Eo, Eo, um, Eo responds and says, If only my frustration were to be weighed or they, place, or, or they were to place my trauma in its entirety upon a scale. Now surely it would outweigh the sands of the seas. Therefore, my words are uttered stammeringly. 
right? He said, he said, I mean, he's, he's, he's giving as good as he gets. He's saying, what are you talking about, you, you insensitive uh, uh, buffoon? Yeah, do you know you you have no idea how my suffering is? If you can't weigh it on the scale, he's saying. Okay, um, this is the tenor of EO. They go back and forth, and it's relatively tame right now. Um, let me let me um, let me introduce now as to to hopefully deepen our understanding of what's going on. Something terribly important, and I don't know if this is the standard thing to do in an EO discussion, but I'm trying to do everything non-standard, and I'm being creative in my approach. Um, now that we're meeting Elifaz, and Elifaz is the most talkative of the friends, we'll soon enough meet Bildad, and then Sofar, and much later Elihu. What's going on here exactly? What's the agenda? What's Moshe Rabbeinu, or EO himself if he's the author? What are they trying to put across to us? So, and there's a lot going on, and it's arguably the least accessible, the most elusive of books. The Rambam, writing in his most controversial work in the Mor Nevuchim, which is usually referred to as the Guide to the Perplexed, looks at the book and looks at this part of the book as the center. And it's interesting because the first two chapters and maybe the last few chapters if anybody learns the they tend to dwell there because that's where a lot of the interesting narrative takes place. The middle of the book is a lot of uh, discussion and, and, and it's, it's confusing. But the Rambam understands the middle is the essence because the middle is all about suffering. And he describes it and, and, and he says the characters themselves, they may be real figures, they're also prototypes and they represent different views of this idea we've been really talking around so far in all of our sessions together, and that's theodicy, which is usually understood as our perception that uh, the righteous suffer, uh, the wicked prosper, and the world doesn't seem to our perception to be, to be quite fair. And uh, this is probably sparked, um, I don't know, the most, but certainly among the most of topics in the world, the most, uh, the greatest of discussions, the deepest of thoughts, volumes have been written. And uh, the Rambam puts it all in a certain perspective, which I'm gonna share in a moment. Uh, I, as those of you are taking notes, it's a good time to get this down. It'll help us approach the rest of the book. Now that we see what the book is gonna feel like, I'm not gonna go again in the entire, we're not gonna do the whole thing inside. But at least we have a feeling of what's really going on in the middle. Let me just say a couple words. Is the Mor Nevuchim a known entity? Has anybody here learned it? The Guide to the Perplexed? Has anybody ever opened it? Okay, one, good, fine. Um, Rambam wrote it near the end of his life. His, it, I mentioned it was, um, the most controversial by far, even though there were sections of the Mishnah Torah that were plenty controversial as well. When they used to burn the Rambam's book, books, it was the first. Rambam wrote, he later defends himself and his defenders also explain this, that he was speaking to his generation, which was very philosophically inclined. And much like others would do the same, Rav Sadigon had done that earlier, and uh, in, in, in the 19th century, of Shipshon Paul Hirsch would try to speak to his audience in a German uh, tone, an academic kind of a level, to reach them where they were holding. Uh, on some level, every rabbi has to know his audience, know his crowd, and be able to speak a language that they can relate to. And that's really what the Rambam was doing. In the Spanish culture in the Golden Age was one of rich intellectual in activity. It was deeply philosophical. And I realize that's a term that's thrown out there a lot. We're not philosophical. We're not really philosophically inclined by a large margin nowadays to the point that I don't even think we really, when we say the word philosophy, I don't think we're thinking about the same thing that they were. Uh, they have a, what, what do you define as philosophy? The like existential question of, of like why we're here, like talking about things that um that are like debatable, I guess, or good. I mean, you know, maybe maybe it's something in, in, in Hebrew we use the term hashkafa, your outlook, the way your ideas about things. 
Yeah, I think that's a fair definition. I think that's how many people at least start to think about philosophy. But in, in the, um, try to picture what was going on, and especially in Spain, but not just in medieval times, um, life was really tough. Spain was better than France or Germany, but it wasn't, wasn't a picnic. And so people speculated as an art form. And they could sit around and just have uh, endless discussions, not just why, and not just uh, n n not just on suffering, but virtually every topic was fair game, and they would speculate endlessly, and a lot of the time brilliantly. And it was addicting. So much so that the great rabbis during this period in, in Spain, uh, were very, very concerned about it. Many Jews got involved in philosophy, and that was their first step out of Judaism. They assimilated into Spanish culture. When coming to terms with the enormity of the Inquisition and, and finally the expulsion of the Jews en masse from Spain in the summer of 1492, Columbus, don't forget, complained there was so much traffic in the harbor he could barely get his own fleet out. Too many Jews sailing. And his fleet contained, uh, included many Jews himself. And there's a, uh, an unverifiable legend that he himself may have had Jewish roots. But um, many speculate that all the suffering of the Spanish Jewish world was due to the over interest, over, over um, obsessiveness with, uh, with philosophy. And uh, philosophy, we've, I've used the term here a few times, could be a black hole because you could go in and never come out again. There was very much of uh, the way people were thinking. It's so the Rambam tapped into that zeitgeist and spoke to it, but it's all Torah. And that's the Mordevuchim. It's a, it's a profound, really quite original work. I don't think there's anything quite like it. People compare it with Rav Sadi Gon's writings and maybe there are a few others along the same lines, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's, trying, it's trying to give an overview um, of the main Jewish principles uh, from again a philosophical standpoint and there are three sections in the third section eov and the discussion in eov is central so even in, in that in itself is a is a really profound point and and, and i think important to emphasis and that is that when the rambam sat down to write his guide to the perplexed i mean even think about the title of the, of the book right he's writing the guide to the perplexed read this and i'll more or less try to explain how life works philosophically and you'll understand, well, then consider what a, what a disproportionate amount of space Eov and the discussion of Eov takes. That's how important Eov is. Uh, okay. um, why There's would, a lot more we could say about the guide. Anybody want to add or, or ask questions? Yeah. Um, Ed, you were saying something? Yeah, yeah. If, if, if the book was all Torah, then why was it so negatively received? This is a content, this is a topic for uh, classes we can do in great depth. I do it pretty briefly. Um, certainly it deserves more focus, but I do go over it on the history, in the history series, if you listen to that period. Uh, he espoused, he seemed to espouse ideas that were Aristotelian. And the Aristotle, the deist idea we've been speaking about and many of the other Arist Aristotelian ideas are, from a Jewish perspective, um, apocorsis are, are flawed to the point of heresy. And um, people accuse the Rambam of espousing some of these ideas. Uh, I'll give you just a sample. Rambam is, is sometimes referred to as overly rational. And it's true in, in a lot of his understandings of, of what we would might call the more mystical aspect of the Torah. Is there, for example, what is what is the world to come look like? What is uh, the Tresa Mesim? To, and what, what, do the, what do the end of days look like? Well, he subscribes to one of the views in the Gemara and Sanhedrin that it's not different in many substantive ways than the world that we have. Okay, that is one view, but the more mystical school uh, adopts a different view that um, Mashiach will bring a totally different existence. Another example is there magic in the world. Rambam says, no, it's all, it's all slate of hand. It's all, it all, in other words, can be explained through cause effect here and now, uh, slate really? of hand. People can just do tricks that can be explained. Um, are there angels, are there demons? Rambam says, no, 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 these are metaphorical ideas. Um, others, Ramban at the forefront, but many others uh, will take them on. 
I mean, the Rambam on these le- on these on these issues is controversial and remains so for centuries. He's also the Rambam. He's a giant. So um, as the Gra assesses him, he's the Gra, who of course uh, wrote wrote extensively on the Rambam, recognizes his uh, the enormity of his Torah and 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 how any any serious Torah scholar must be completely conversant in the Rambam's writings. And then the Gra makes an exception, except except for ha- Philosophia Haarura. The Vilna Gaon says, except for that cursed ph- philosophical garbage. Uh-huh. Well, I, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not of the stature. None of us are to be able to say such a thing, but the Gra is. So does that give you a little bit of an answer, Ed? Yeah, 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 that does. Yeah. Uh, some say that some of the, that he, Rambam was just giving his enemies uh, an, an excuse to, to hate him and burn his books. They were, among other things, in Bavl, resentful that he was the Gunnel Ador. They felt that they should be the Gunnel Ador. And uh, other kinds of things, but but there was there were there was substance to the debate, and it was resolved within a couple hundred years, but not 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 immediately. In the Morn of Ulchim, Rambam um, describes the different views, and I'm doing this at the beginning to introduce it so that they'll make a little bit more sense as we go through them. And I'll give you just one tonight: uh, the different views on um, how you look at suffering. Um, and remember our equation again. We gotta. We've got an, really an unavoidable problem. If Hashem, as we assume, is all good, and Hashem is all powerful, and suffering happens in the world, and good people suffer, so then something's got to give. Now, what, do we, what do we do with that uh, mathematical inconsistency? Now, one of the things we'll find, and we sort of saw this in Eliphaz now, I didn't do a comprehensive take on him, but uh, uh, you could you can look, look at it yourself and see. Um, we don't really find any of the protagonists, any of the friends, Alifaz, Bildad, so far, uh, or I should say in the positive. None of them assume that Hashem is chas v'shalom, uncaring, unknowing, impotent. I mean, this it's a given. It's a basic assumption. It's certainly a Jewish assumption that Hashem is omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing. Uh, even though they have different approaches, they share the conviction that uh, Hashem is perfectly just and everything works out. So here are different ways of dealing with this, this, uh, this conundrum, this riddle. The first way is, not, is implied but not discussed openly because it's, it's not a legitimate view from any of their perspectives and nor from a Jewish perspective. It's one we call apocorsis, uh, which means her- heresy, in which you, you minimize Hashem. Either you say he's not really governing, uh, everything is random. He may exist, he may not exist, but that has no bearing on our lives. Interestingly, Aristotle, who writes about these themes himself, um, he doesn't call it Epicorsus because to do that, you have to subscribe to a very specific uh, point of view. He doesn't do that, but he calls it very illogical because from Aristotle's point of view, at least, you look around the world, and there's obviously a design so that you want to conclude everything's random. He says, that's not possible. I mean, clearly there's something magical at work here out in the world. Even a rational thinker like Aristotle had to, had to, had to say that. So that's one view that we'll put on the table just as a straw man, but it's not one that's considered deeply in Eov. The second view is Eliphaz, who we just met. And the Rambam says Eliphaz he, he refers to this as a Torah kind of idea that Eliphaz espouses. He, he calls it Chochme Soraseinu, the wise men of our Torah. That's what Elif, Eliphaz represents. Uh, El, Eliphaz is tricky, though. And you can't say that he's the purest Torah idea on this, on this because, again, he comes through so flawed. But he is still saying some legitimate um, core idea. He says... Um, all that transpires, all that happens to a person is determined by that person's actions. Everything that happens, happens for a reason, and it all correlates to what we do, how we behave. There's reward, there's punishment, period. That's the way it is. It's a, consider this for a little bit too. It's very stark, uh, refresh, refreshingly accessible and simple approach. It's one that most people in the world today reject with two hands. 
Does anybody remember this happening recently? I think this might even post date a lot of your uh, time being in my shear, but um, I guided a family from Marin County and uh, reformed Jews. They came to me through my old boss when I used to teach in reform synagogue, who I'm still in touch with. I think I sent you my response to my boss's request in the coronavirus. Anybody might have read a few lines that I wrote. Anyway, yeah. this family was with me. And, and usually when you're teaching people or you're encountering people, the initial phase is you want to make a connection. Well, we did. I mean, we hit it off really nicely from the get-go. We spoke. They asked questions. It was a very, very nice tour. I think I took them to the David Tower Museum and we we're going and that's my that's my place. That's a spring, springboard for all kinds of uh, what I think are great stories in history and Ashkafa. And we're talking and at one point we're talking about we, we get to the end of the second temple room and we start talking about the Horban and its implications. And I assert to them that we the Jewish view is that we believe that everything happens for a purpose and that a hate gorem that everything that the sin and also the opposite virtue determine the flow of history. And looking back at it now, I, I, I'm pretty sure I saw the man, the father of the family, his eyelids did like a double double flap. And like he just, he, um, I lost him right then and there. And he took me on immediately. And for the rest of the day, he was hostile. And when he was paying attention, when, when he, you know, only when he was paying attention, he was hostile. And otherwise he was just on his phone the whole time. Like I lost him altogether because I asserted this idea that there's accountability and that somehow our fate is in our hands. And for him and for so many others in the world today, they reject that altogether. He said, the classic simplistic argument, he said, are you insinuating that the victims of the Nazi regime deserved what they got? Right, which is a sharp way of asking the question. I said, I, I'm not insinuating it. I'm, I'm simply saying that the Jewish view is that there is a connection. We can't always interpret that it, what it is. We don't necessarily know what's punishment, what's reward, or how it all lines up. We don't think it's arbitrary. We think that everything happens for a reason and that we're very tied to those reasons. Well, he was not accepting that. And a lot of people don't accept that. And uh, I don't know, consider for yourself. Elifaz is saying it in very, very uh, stark, very, very clear terms. Everything happens for a purpose. And if you look back at the words we, we discussed, the, the psukim that we saw tonight as well, the, he's very much saying that. You know, and, and it's probably too much and too soon for Eve to hear, but um, that's that's the view. And the Rambam says that is a Torah idea. Okay, I'm going to see what the Torah's full view of all this is, but this particular notion is certainly central. Um, Eliphaz, he says, speaks from Nevoah. He has prophecy. Uh, he says it's all about people in the world. We're the center. Uh, there's no hashgacha for animals. He'll come to say it another time. Right? Animals are, everything's here. All the parts of creation are all here for people. We're playing the central role in the ongoing drama. He says all people are involved, Jews and non-Jews. And we all receive exactly what we deserve uh, in this world and next. Well, if you're considering all this, what you have to say then is that he's, what, what Eliphaz is doing, he's certainly not answering the problem of theodicy, but he's amplifying the problem of theodicy. Because now what you're saying is, yeah, 100%. If, if people are suffering, there's a reason for that. And that's somehow collect, co correlated to something that they're doing. And if people are prospering, there's a, there's a reason for that. And, okay, well, then you were really, um, something's got to give. You know, it's going to be tricky to figure this out. Um, his emphasis, Alifaz, he says, really, almost none of us are really all that deserving. So if we experience misfortune, which is most people's uh, lot in life, okay. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Most of us really don't deserve much better. This is what it is. He says, um, not subtly, you're like this, Eo. Um, later, we're going to see he's reproached, not because of his ashkafa, but because of his tactlessness. Uh, look at Eo's response. If, we, if you still have it open, in the sixth chapter, the sixth verse, 
Eov asks, he says, can bland food be eaten without salt? Is there taste in healthy spittle? A little bit, little bit subtle what he's saying, but he's essentially saying, your words are bland food. And, you know, can they be eaten without salt? They're putting salt in my wounds, right? Is there taste? You're, you're, you're spitting, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're more distressing than anything afflicting me right now says Eov in reaction. Uh, we'll continue this, Bezrash Hashem. We'll talk about Bildad, who represents a very dominant Muslim way of dealing with theodicy in the world. Uh, we'll talk about Sofar, who's another Muslim uh, idea. This is all according to the Rambam. We'll get to Elihu, even though it's a little before us. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll go through properly the sixth chapter and on. I'll pick out support um, important psukim. I think we're over halfway done, but I'm taking my time and enjoying it. Um, questions, thoughts, feedback? Mm. Wow. Yeah. It's Was it crowd. tonight incomprehensible? You followed? And we changed gears a little bit. Okay, thanks for that, Shamai. Fine. Great. Okay, uh, tomorrow night we're on as usual, nine o'clock, two Eastern Standard Time, and um, I'll stay. I'll stay online if anybody wants to. Speak. How was the wedding? How was the wedding? Um, oh, well, let me report. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. really special. Both weddings. I went. I, I was Zoche. I think I might have been the only one who got to both. Um, wow, nice. Yeah, have, they, have any of you been to a wedding during Corona days? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's you would be legal. Cool. Yeah. It's not really been out of our house. I mean, I go it's between here and Orsameach and the grocery store. That's that's those are my venues. Well, I, you know, I um, brought a shirt. And you know why? Why? Nobody has a clue. A I uh, had been to the coast cell in thirty days, so I tore Korea. Oh, most people wow. rely. Well, if you haven't been to the coast in thirty days, you check Korea. I, I I don't remember the last time I haven't been to the coast in thirty days. I always go to the coast. I'm always I'm always in the old city, but um, no, I haven't been to the coast. So I, I initially I brought an extra shirt. Uh, you don't have to tear if you're wearing a nice shirt. You don't have to tear that one. You have to tear something. So I tried to draw the shirt and cried. Uh, I seen the coast cell. and then um, I was I went to Rabbi Brickman's daughter's wedding first. Uh, they have a beautiful place. I Bezrash Hashem next Monday night. Eitan Yaakov Greenspan. This will be meaningful to you, um, especially. I hope this was to be in the exact same location at Avram McGrefta's wedding. Wow. On oh, Monday. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very, he called me yesterday, and I'm thrilled to be able to be a part of it. I don't get to go to most of, most of your weddings. You're over there. I'm over here. But this is, uh, I'm very excited about that. In our defense, uh, we haven't had so many weddings yet. <laughs> <laughs> I accept. I accept the apologies, but you'll get on that case, please, Aton, quickly. Um, so, <laughs> you try, Rabbi. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, the the Brickman wedding was in a very and the Magarefta wedding as well will be in a gorgeous setting, right above. If you can picture, you're coming down from the Arab Shuk, and then um, you enter the coastal from. The, the, the left side and go down. There's a road right where they're checking your bags. There's a road that could take you up towards Asia, Asia Torah, right above that road with a spectacular view over Harabais and the coast. Yeah, of the I, saw, I saw the live stream. It was really nice. Yeah. Oh, you saw the live stream. So you can picture it. Oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. was it. Um, there were a few of us there. Rabbi, Rabbi Raskin was there and Rabbi Rosen was there and uh, others came later. Um, and I wrote Rabbi Brickman afterwards that there was, for me at least, there was a sense of grandeur because obviously you're standing in that place, but also I think in these times, you know, when there's tragedy in the world, maybe it brings you back to something that's a little bit more fundamental about what we're doing in life, kind of, you know, kinds of cosmic questions and perspectives. And a wedding, of course, you know, seeing the first of the Brickman children to have a wedding. And uh, that's very much what we're about the transmission the next generation here we are we're living in such uh, divine divinely providential times and we're part of something sometimes we get so immersed in our own lives and activities that we forget this but being in such an, a, an event really brings you back to what we're doing and what we're trying to do i then after a long a full day of teaching i'm teaching every day all day um 
exhausted. Uh, but I ran from the old city back to my car near Meisharim, and uh, and then drove out to a farm in Mavo Choron, which is, if you can picture it, down at the bottom of Route One. You make a right turn to Latrun, Park Canada, Park I alone, and a little bit straight before you get to uh, Carrie Safer was the farm where the Greenwald wedding was. And I know my, my good friend, Rabbi Greenwald, was very moved that I was there. Uh, I was the only uh, only one, I think, who was able to. It's really complicated. It's hard to get around now, you know. So uh, I happen to know everybody. I know the other side really well. I know a bunch of people there. Former um, Derek Rebbe. Um, some of you might remember Rebbe Yirmiyal Lesson. He's a good friend of mine, too, uh, was there. Anyway, and, and it was beautiful. But the wedding, but, you know, we have all these contrary impulses. We all want to do the right thing, right? So we all have masks on and gloves. And I can kind of hear people through the muffle, but it's kind of hard to make things go a little bit. You know what I mean? You know, and, like, um, I don't get the part of the gloves. I actually, I get the part of the mask, but the gloves are like, you know, you, you touch your face I with the gloves. what they do is it. they remind you not to touch your face. Because I yeah, know the, the gloves don't are... actually protect you against. In fact, they actually do anything. worse. The medical community is up in arms that people are using gloves because yeah. if you yeah, want to use gloves, you have to keep so changing them. Right. And, and also, and, your skin will get rid of the virus faster than the glove will. It will stay on the glove longer <laughs> than it'll stay in your hand. I'm sure you that's know? true. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we had gloves because we held hands. Uh, and then this uh, is the gloves. Not only you know, works, but, you, have, but, you have to immediately no, I, take I, off I just, the clothes. I, I, I want to convey, like, there was, like, a, a contrary impulse. So the one that we're, we're trying to be, the, the people who were there are so careful. I know them, I know many of the people, very, very careful. But then immediately the chassan comes out and he's glowing. Shragi, Shragi Greenwald, the second, the second oldest son. And he's glowing. And you just, ah, oh, you're just so there for him. And, like, he's dancing. And his friends are there. And you all dance. And so you kind of move forward. And, oh, no, I shouldn't move forward. And then you come. And then, and then everybody's just dancing. And then you join the circle. And you're thinking, maybe this is not such a good idea. But then, you, you know, you're doing that mitzvah. So, anyway, we tried. Is there, we tried. Is there a reason? Oh, 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 yeah. What? Um, Rabbi, is there a reason why, like, you should not um, postpone the wedding? Yeah, 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 yeah very much. Knows. Very much. It's, it's a halachic and oshkafic imperative. The reason we don't postpone weddings is because then they don't happen right. sometimes. Oh, okay. So With it's the like there's a halachic. Of life and the, you know, the, the fragile nature of human beings and egos and such, uh, you know, they can call it off, and sometimes that happens. You want the thing to get done. It's like a business deal. I mean, it's started to be crude. But there is that aspect of it. It's it's almost like a business deal where you know if you don't close the deal right away, it may not happen. And uh, we are all about the propagation of the species and the people. And we want them to get married. We want them to have babies. We want all that to work out. So we try to we, in halacha, there are all kinds of reasons to to get you know to move on with the thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they were they were very memorable affairs, and uh, it's a big simcha to uh, be marrying off our children. It's not a small thing. Yeah. Yeah. Should I be talking someday? Anybody else? Also, anybody just else just on? being engaged is hard. Like you wanna, you you, you wanna be married. Also, yeah. right? Rav Shach said, like Ari saying, actually Ari saying, like Rav Shach said. No offense. Uh, Rav, Shach Rav Shach said Shach two said hours, said right? You should have the shortest engagements possible. Yeah. That's my experience in counseling people too. Engagements are a lot of the obligations and 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 and, and dreary parts of marriage without any of the perks. Yeah, people are you know, engaged have, for years, you know, like a year or two. You know, they're just like, oh, we're, this is my fiance. They're just like, oh yeah, no need to get married. Yeah, well, I guess if you're not from, it doesn't make right. a difference. It's the right. difference in being single and married anyway. Yeah, right. You know, they mean right. together one way or the other. But if Makes you're sense. if you're religious, then you don't. You know, you can get into a fight or misunderstanding, but then you each go to your separate respective homes and you can't work it out. So the potential for explosions or misunderstandings are quite great. Uh, Rav Shach recommended that they see each other as minimally as possible uh, and uh, get on with the wedding so that you can move on to life already. But wow. uh, sometimes logistics make that impossible. So you have to yeah. figure out how to do that properly. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Rabbi. All right, great to see you. Have a great night or afternoon, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank okay, you. bye. Bye, Tov. Bye, Tov.